do here is I want to use this understanding of work to come up with a way to describe the simple machines. All right, once again, what does work mean? Work is the act of exerting a force through a distance in the direction of the force. The act of exerting a force through a distance in the direction of the force. How do we calculate or quantify the amount of work? We multiply the amount of force times the distance that it moves in the direction of the force. If the force is this way and we move this way, we end up with a positive value because they're both positive. If the force is this way and the distance we move is this way, we multiply them together, we end up with a negative amount of work because the distance moved is not in the same sense as the direction of the force. It's in the same line of action, but it's not the same sense, sense in the sense of being negative or positive. All right, now, well, let's write that down. Let's say that the force that goes into the machine times the distance that that in force, input force moves. And again, when I say the input force, I'm assuming it's in the direction of the input force. Uh, times the efficiency is equal to the force that comes out of the machine times the distance that that output force moves. That's essentially the same thing that we wrote over there. Now if in fact, no, notice what we can do here. Let's take and, and rewrite this in this form. We could simply say that the efficiency is equal to the force that comes out of the machine times the distance that that output force moves divided by the force that goes into the machine, divided by the distance that that input force moves. Everybody with me? All I've done is rewritten this in a more expanded format. Now what I'm going to do is rewrite this as the division of two fractions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it this way. We'll take the force that comes out of the machine and we'll divide that by the force that goes into the machine. Then we'll divide that whole thing by the distance that the input force moves divided by the distance that the output force moves. You say, are those the same thing? Sure. When we have two fractions being divided, we take the denominator, we invert it, and we multiply it by the numerator. Well, if we take this and invert it, we're going to have the output force multiply, I mean, excuse me, the output distance multiplied by the output uh, uh, force, which will give me that. And then in the denominator, I'm going to have the input force multiplied by the input distance, which gives me this. Um, if this is a concern to you, take and just write it down for now, and then when you have a moment, carry out that division to make sure that it's the same thing. The reason that I, I'm doing this is that I wanted to take and show you here is the ratio of the force that's at the output of the machine to that at the input of the machine. Simple machines are defined by the work that they do. But what I want to do is I want to sort of demonstrate this idea of force in and force out. And so what I did is I've got one here that uh, I, I've tried to hold these things so that the weight doesn't have to do it. And, and this guy isn't quite at zero. He's, at, he's setting at about 50 grams. These aren't very good here. But what I want to do is I want to take and exert a force on here. All right, so I'm going to take and come out here. And notice I got that guy over there at almost full scale, haven't I? And this guy here is only up to maybe a third of the scale. Can you see that there? Okay. What's happening is I'm multiplying a force. Now what's wrong with this is that the force isn't doing any work. So this isn't valid as far as a simple machine is concerned. It's got to be moving. But the point I'm getting at is that I'm multiplying a force. 
this thing here, the ratio of the actual force that comes out of the machine to the actual force that goes into the machine, we're going to call the actual mechanical advantage. The actual mechanical advantage. It tells you what the machine is actually doing. Now, what would happen if this efficiency is equal to 1? Well, that says that what's down here is exactly equal to what's up here, doesn't it? Well, this here has nothing to do with forces. It has to do with the distances that the force moved. It's all geometry. And so it's completely immune to any kind of frictional consideration. The only thing that is affected by friction would be the forces that come out of the machine. Okay, So what we're going to do is we're going to define this ratio as the ideal mechanical advantage. Where do you suppose the word ideal come from? Well, if we assumed it's a 100% efficient machine, that would be an ideal machine. The way you find the ideal mechanical advantage is you determine how far the input force moves and divide it by how far the output force moves, period. I have five machines set up here. We've got a pulley system here. Uh, we will take and take this as the input here, and this will be the output. Okay, this is the output, this is the input. I want you to find the actual mechanical advantage, ideal mechanical advantage, and the efficiency of this machine. Okay, here I have two machines. We have an inclined plane, but the cart's got a pulley on it. This is the output, not the cart. I have all kinds of coaches and kids arguing <laughs> with me about that. This is not a physics class. This is a simple machines class. If you're running a silver mine and you send a cart down the tracks and you fill it up with ore and you pull it up and you dump it out, what has been the useful work done? It's the pile of ore on the ground. It's not the weight of the cart. If you include the weight of the cart every time you pull it up out of the mine as being useful ore, somebody's going to jail for embezzlement. When you take and use a crowbar, if you happen to be pulling a nail out overhead, the weight of the crowbar helps you and it gives you a higher actual mechanical advantage. If you happen to be pulling it out of the floor, the weight of the crowbar works against you and you have a lower actual mechanical advantage. You with me? Okay, so what I do is I tell the kids, Everything hanging on the input end has to be considered as input force. The weight hanger and everything at the input is part of the input. But at the output, it's whatever is in the cart or whatever is defined as the output. The other machine, that, another one over here, is a, a lever. Now, on this one, you have to be a little careful. Because notice, as this goes up, this, by the way, is the input. This is the output. This is the fulcrum. This is not the kind of lever most of you are used to. Notice that this fulcrum pulls down instead of pulls up. I used this in the national tournament this year, this exact setup. Okay. Now, what you need to do on here is you have to bear in mind that as this thing goes up and down, the direction of the input force changes. This thing pivots. Not a lot, but some. The output pivots also. So that means that the distances moved are not necessarily in the direction of the forces. So what you have to do on something like this in order to minimize that and to get a reasonably accurate result, you have to determine when this is level, okay, then lower it about five degrees and take and go from that position to about five degrees above that position and the directions of the force will 
the change of directions of the forces will be uh, imperceptible. So you have to measure this through a very short scan. How do you do something like that? Well, maybe we could take and be clever. Maybe we could take and build a little platform to set this on here. You know, you wouldn't measure the forces this way, but you maybe could measure the geometry this way. Find out what it is here, measure what this distance is, then take and set it up some more. Measure what this change has been, measure what this change has been. The trick here though, you have to be careful anytime there's a string device, including that pulley, is that you need to have this right at the point where it's ready to lift off. You have to have the string under tension because a string stretches. And if we want to get true distance measurements, we have to load this thing to where it's essentially balanced with the exception of a very small amount of mass. That way the string then will be as long as it's going to be when the system is working. Over here, I, I set up one of my black boxes. Go ahead and determine this. You'll probably find that the efficiency of this machine is pretty poor. The reason I have it like this instead of sideways is that I find that the um, uh, bearings, the string bearings that I have in the sides of the boxes are, have quite a bit of friction in them. They're nylon. And uh, I, ma I made them and I didn't have a lot of time, so I'm going to have to go back and redesign this a little bit to, to try to reduce some of the friction because the efficiencies in these things are getting down below 50%. They're like 30%, 35%, whatever. I'll let you tell me what they're going to be. Okay. This pulley here, this is my surprise for next year. This one's got three simple machines in it. It has a multiple diameter pulley. It has an inclined plane, plus it's got a block and a tackle. And I had to put a kilogram of mass in it so that my 50 gram weight holder wouldn't take and be too much to pull that kilogram weight up the hill. Okay? And I have a new machine that I'm working on for the national tournament next year. Uh, I haven't got it, I haven't got it done. But every year you can expect some kind of a new machine that the kids are not going to know about. Okay. And all they have to know is what's on that blackboard. And if they know what's on the blackboard, it doesn't matter what I throw at them, they'll be able to take and do it. That'll be um, uh, station number one, two, three, four, and five. You can start at any station you want to. It's not to, moving right now, though, right, is it? In order to move it, I'm going to have to apply a force. Right. And then you need I don't know how we're going to measure that unless we have right. some metric steel. Right. So you've got an input of 30.8 and an output of 7.7. Uh, and the AMA, right? So it would be out no. by the end. No, this is IMA. This we're measuring IMA. So 30 input divided by output. 30.8 divided by 7.7. Divided by. Seven the only time when this force is going to be equal to the force required to bring this card up the incline is when it's coming up at a constant speed. The thing that most people don't realize or don't, don't remember is that force is not necessary for something to be moving. The only time force is necessary is to get it to change the way it's moving. The only time you feel anything is when you change the way you're moving. See, I don't feel a thing until bang, then I feel something, and that's because I'm changing the way I'm moving. So force is what changes the way you move. So what you want is a constant force, I mean, a, a, a zero net force on this thing. So it comes up at a constant speed. If I were to take and measure to that little hole there, or to right. this little speck, yeah. and I take and move it like this. Okay, I just want to know how far. Then I measure it and measure how far that's moved. That's all I have to do. The measurement yeah, errors will be larger. Huh? You don't have to. Gonna balance, that's right. Going to you see, it's it's the ratio of the distance move. You yeah, see, right. the ratio of motion between this and this for this is the same as for this. If I take this distance and divide by this right. distance, I get exactly the same number as if I take and move it 
this distance and divide by this. Does that make sense? So you don't need the weights at all? Well, you do yeah. when it comes well, time for the, the when, you, when you try to get the cart to come up. The but for we the, can choose whatever but, we want. But for constant, for constant um, pressure, wouldn't you use a scale? Wouldn't it work better with the scale? The, the you could of, try it with the scale if you want to have them. Uh, but it's, it's the, I use the dead weights yeah. because it's really hard to know when it's exactly constant. I can, you see there's two things you have to do when you use a, a, a scale. You have to judge when the car is moving at a constant speed and you have to take and, and be able to read the scale. Here we ha only have to judge at when the car is moving at a constant speed then when it stops moving and when it hits the floor then we can measure count up the weights and figure out what that force was that caused that. You got .067 all right, that would be less than 10%. Now let's see. Well, let's see, how much did this move? How did you measure this motion? We measured the position of the weight. Oh, okay, all right, let's, let's try this again. Where, where did you start, let's see. All right, now, is, that looks like about horizontal there, right? Okay, let's take and say, Let's just, let's just take and come down here. We'll just be exaggerated, all right? With it like...